Anthony Nayak. I'm not a data scientist like the others in this room. I'm actually um, managing director at uh, Accenture, but I'm on the design side. So um, we acquired a company called Fjord, which is a design consultancy. And my role there is to really uh, fuse design and data. So um, as you, we talked to what Tatiana had talked about is you're trying to create new services. And as you create these new services, um, you have to make them consumable by humans. And to do that, a lot of the data science stuff has to work with design in order to create the right, right visualizations, right experiences, right services that actually enable people to make the right decisions and to enable business outcomes. Right. Um, so that's where I come from, and I'm working with um, uh, Nate here uh, to try to bring these things to together. So we are sort of working on how do we do that? How do we bring the design side of the equation uh, with the data side, and how do we work together, left brain, right brain, uh, to figure out how to deliver next generation solutions? Right. Um, so uh, at Fjord, um, we are a, a, a company which has about over 15 to 16 studios globally. We are like IDEO or Frog. You might have heard of them. Uh, we're similar to them, um, but we have been acquired by Accenture, and so um, we work a lot on trying to figure out what the consumer trends are. So every year we produce a set of trends from a consumer perspective on what's going on in human behavior, and uh, that helps us figure out what are the design problems we are working on. So what we thought we'd start today is uh, take you through a few of these, and these are available on SlideShare. So if you go look for Fjord Trends 2016, you'll, you'll find the detail. But I'll jump into a few of these and then tell you why it's important for us to, to, to talk about them. So these are the 10 that we have, and I think one of the things that Tatiana talked about is why is this stitch fix important in this world, and I just want to talk about it, is a flattening of privilege. Right? Having your own personalized tailor, um, having your own uh, Uber service makes you feel like you, you have that sort of privileged, um, privileged life, right? And so that human in the equation is important because we've all turned into a look down generation. It's time to look up again. Right, to figure out how to have that human interaction enabled by technology that enables you to have some of these services. So um, let's go through some of, uh, some of the things that we have here today. So one of them is disappearing apps. Uh, what we've found um, is that uh, you all have, you, how many of you use apps? You all do, right? How many apps do you use on a regular basis? Yeah. So what, what is happening these days is there's too many apps, right? I, I know everybody says, oh, there's an app for that. But what we are beginning to find is that human expectations on, ma you're spending a lot of information processing power from a human perspective on managing these apps. So every time you want to do something, you have to jump to a different app, and you go down, you look at the app, and you move to the next thing. I'm a consultant. I fly all around the world. And every time I have to figure out which, which airline I'm taking, I have to go to that app and then figure out how that app works to get whatever I need to get done. So what we're beginning to find is that um, apps are not on the brink of extinction, but you're beginning to see a set of platforms that are enabling you to manage your apps in app interactions. Things like Siri, for example. You say, Siri, um, what's the weather like today? Right? And Siri will tell you that you know, she goes to the weather app because it tells you the answer. Right? Um, if you say, what time is my flight today uh, to Atlanta? And you know, it goes back and figures out, oh, the flight is Delta, so it's whatever. So you're beginning to see a set of platforms that are curating these, these experiences for you without you having to operate the app yourself. So um, they've reached a tipping point. Uh, we believe we are in the midst of what we call atomization, though. So what we have seen a lot of atomized services occurring. Uh, you see things like TaskRabbit, you think, uh, you know, small little things that, that are beginning to become services. And they can be apps. But what they enable you to do is to have all of the tasks you need to get done sort of integrated. And the platforms are emerging that allow you to actually integrate them into a broader, higher order service. So what the trend we are seeing here um, uh, is that instead of us becoming app administrators, we are now um, taking the best of the services that exist and implementing in them into more natural use cases. So this is a trend that you'll begin to see. And Google and Apple and everybody is trying to become the platform. Um, it has an interesting implication for brand. Um, so you, we have to think about that. Right? Which brands are going to be the ones curating your experience, and which are the ones that are going to be the services that are APIs or plugins in, into that platform. Right? So we are working on, with a lot of clients on this, is how do you take your value proposition and turn it into um, you know, something bigger, because you've understood that you can't be just that little thing. But then who's the one curating? Who is in the front with the, with the, with the customer? 
So looking forward, um, what we what we want want to figure out is, you know, what are these um, platforms going to look like, and what will they do, and which ones are going to be the emergent ones that allow you um, to, you know, to do a lot of things. So for example, uh, Nest, you know, is the, is is a promising point of access. We call it a point of integration. So everybody wants to manage the the um, you know ambiance inside their homes, and uh, Next becomes that point of access, and then Next. Uh, I mean, Nest could begin to expand to do other things. Uh, Amazon Echo wants to do the same thing. Today, it, it tells you a few things, plays music. Tomorrow, it's listening. So one is listening and could do other things. Uh, Google now wants to do that. You know, everybody wants to. So one of the things as data science you have to figure out is really figure out what are the different application services that data can provide in, and how is it going to connect to others so that you create a high order service. So what? Um, sorry, am I going the wrong way? So what we suggest is that um, for brands is that we try to create um, instead of looking at a specific product or service by itself, uh, we are helping clients build what we call journey maps. We use a service design methodology. So we say, okay, um, as you did uh, with Stitch Fix, for example, instead of saying what are the clothes you need, you say what are you trying to do with your life? What are the things that are important decisions in that life? And then how do I, as a service, fit into that life? And a lot of companies, believe it or not, don't take this direction. They always look at their product, and they're pushing product. They're pushing product. And that's why you get all this noisy advertising that goes on. If you want to have more natural interfaces, you have to say, what is the right time to offer this service? And do I have to be front and center to offer it, or can I do it very, very naturally behind the scenes? And how do we help uh, people do that? The second uh, trend we want to sort of talk about is watch it listen. As designers, one of the things that designers don't do well is they're always presenting information, but they're not listening to whether the information is being used or not. So um, with, with things like Amazon Echo and the Apple Watch, it's less about the touch interface or the voice interface, which is an important evolution, but it's more about what is, what is, what is it doing to listen to data, right? So uh, the capture of ambient information, as you call this, or contextual information, is what is changing the world, right? More and more uh, con you know, data is being collected. And sometimes we have to design to collect it properly. So we did a project, for example, with a retailer where they wanted to say, well, I want to understand what people are doing in the store. But how do you understand that? You have to set down sensors at the right points and figure out what information you want to collect and how do you aggregate that information into a value-added service. So the, uh, in Watch It Listens, uh, while voice technology and gesture and stuff is important, uh, we have to realize that things are listening. And as it, data scientists working with designers, you have to figure out, well, what data is missing? Where's the sparse, sparseness in the data set? What are some ambient things that I have to understand? And how do I collect that data? So I'm trying to teach our designers to start thinking about design to listen. Not design to present, but design to listen. And this is a key because there's a privacy issue, as you all know. There's issues about you know, what's the right collection me mechanism, how do you set the right expectations in terms of what that collection would mean and how it's handled and stuff like that. So um, what, what we are saying is essentially um, in, in, this, in this space, we really need to focus on what are the moments that we are going to try to affect with the experiences we're creating. And in that moment, what is the data you need? So I've created a method inside uh, Fjord called data potential. Right? So as um, designers start beginning to look at uh, what is the data I need to understand the context of this customer, I say, well, think about, all, instead of doing that, think about all the things you'd like to know before you start doing the design. Right? So um, they say that data scientists are successful in three ways. One, they know all the methods and models that everybody has. Second is domain knowledge. And the third is really asking the right questions. Now, designers are very good at asking the right questions. So a, a combination of design and data would be that designers help you ask the contextual questions of what's important, and then you go and figure out whether you have the data to answer the question. Right? Uh, focusing in those m moments is going to be uh, um, very important. So be there at the moment, try to be useful at the moment, be quick, and measure whether that moment is working or not. So listening leads to learning, as we all know. So as we uh, talked in this earlier example, you have that closed feedback loop in terms of understanding, well, did that work? Either through multivariate experimentation or through um, 
understanding the signals that are coming in and analyzing them to say, is there a new pattern uh, in the data? So what we suggest is having that listen and learn uh, kind of uh, capability. So the final thing I'd talk about is thinking, taking things off the thinking list. And this is something that we are trying to get um, all our clients to think about, right? A lot of uh, products and services that are out there are very much about, um, very much about do the, doing these 15 different tasks to get to that goal, right? So in order to select um, a product, a shirt, or whatever it is you want to buy, you go to the website, you have to go to Amazon, you have to go to the catalog, you have to go down to you know, that specific section, or you have to set, create a, you know, select a set of facets and then get to the detail. Now, do I have to do that? I have, I have to 50, I wasted 15 seconds doing, going through that. You can ask Siri and say, Siri, find me a shirt, right? And so what you're beginning to see is these conversational interfaces. Facebook is creating that. Facebook next generation is going to be, it's going to say, I need a shirt. And it will go back and figure out through your tastes as well as through patterns that other people have bought like you, we come back and answer you through a messaging interface. A messaging interface will become more important than a mobile interface or a desktop interface. So we're beginning to see evolution of these things. So um, everything was better back when everything was worse. Because, it's too <laughs> because there was too much choice now, right? We have too much choice. And it's coming at us in, in very vast um, and fast ways. So people are getting tired of the choice they have. And so it's like me. I don't go to Nordstrom anymore. I go to the local boutique, right? Because there's fewer choices, and I can get out of there faster. So what we can do to um, you know, allow the reveal of brands, like we did with Stitch Fix, in a way that the catalog gets in the background, and the stylist actually becomes a curator of creating your personal style, which is a, a great example of um, how these things happen. You're taking things off the thinking list. I didn't, don't need to know how many classifications of you know, products you have. I'll just tell you what I need, and you tell me what I should have. Right? So th these are the sorts of things that are happening. So um, lots of companies are beginning to now see that reducing choice is having business effects. Right? So curation is having business effects, or recommendation systems, or even cutting down on product catalogs. I was at a large technology company the other day, and they had a choice table that goes off the, off the charts. And so selecting the three or five products, or pretending you only have three or five products, even though you may have 15, and presenting those is a, is a thought process we are trying to uh, enable with our clients. And you, you're beginning to see also automat automated ordering with you know, these buttons that Amazon is beginning to show. And this becomes sort of the automation of pattern. I know every month you're buying this. Push the button, I get it done for you. So people are beginning to become more comfortable with, with not having to go and to the store to pick up certain things. This, this type of automation will, will happen. So uh, what we are saying is data is the engine behind creating these things that mind our thinking list. Right? So you have a set of tasks. I have to go to the... Um, doctor, I have to go to pick up groceries, I have to go do my laundry, whatever. What if there was a button that did that for you, right? Or did that or enabled that for you? For doing laundry, there may be a button from TaskRabbit, some guy comes, does your laundry. You know, somebody picks up the laundry. You know? So these are the things that are happening. It's, it's amazing that they are. So if you wanted a choice of having somebody clean your kitchen or do your gardening or do something for you, these services are beginning to appear. Uh, and soon will be um, will be table stakes. We believe that take away the apps, take away the people, and you can enable these atomized services being, becoming available. So um, we are suggesting that uh, clients begin to look at um, the, the sets of things, the burden they're putting on customers and consumers, on what what needs to happen, and take that take that um, take that away, and try to figure out how to do that, how to help them make decisions with uh, with approaches that we have. So um, all this points to the fact that we were in the age of the internet, you know, in the 90s. We moved to the age of mobility where we have phones. Go ahead. Uh, I like your comment in the end because I was just thinking about it, uh, saying, like, we don't want to choose anything. So what are we going to do in that time? Like, what are we? So that kind of addresses to that point, saying, while simplification wins, don't over and sacrifice the thrill of discovery. So can you elaborate on how, on your thoughts on how to achieve that? Right, so I think the platforms that are emerging are helping you figure out what choices you really want to make and which choices you don't care about. Right? I have bought 
the same brand of toothpaste and the same brand of Tide or whatever it is I buy for years. You know what? I don't, I'm not changing my mind about that. And that's a decision I might automate. Whereas in, the, in, in terms of my style or whatever, I'm, I'm not willing to, to do that. I don't want a bot to tell me what I'm going to wear tomorrow, right? So then um, services like Stitch Fix, where there is somebody curating my style, uh, something that I have a role in choosing. So while you can create simplification, there's what we call progressive disclosure, right? If you want more detail and you want to know how the decision is making, or you want to know what the catalog looks like, you should be able to. But you ha need to have an opportunity to not have to make those choices. So this is where firms are now beginning to say you can have, you can enable decisions that are automated fully, that are decisions that can be human curated and, and, and this, uh, enabled for you, or you can make the decision yourself, right? So you're talking, it sounds like primarily uh, in the, the consumer level, but you know, it's really at the corporate level where there's decision rights that are distributed all throughout the organization, but you know, so much of that is, is, is routine uh, and, and could, be, could be routinized and free up um, kind of intellectual uh, power and skill for the, just distilled down to the key decisions. Absolutely. Um, do you think that there, the kind of design thinking or understanding of the process that is used to understand the consumer experience maps over well into those corporate contexts, or is that sort of a um, it's beginning to. substantively different way of thinking about decisions? Um, the, some of the decisions end up being more complex decisions rather than simple ones like this, but we are beginning to have this notion called liquid expectations. We are all consumers in the end, and whatever we experience in the market in terms of simplicity, we're beginning to expect at work. The millennial generation are not tolerant of the complexity and the burden that um, you know, processes are putting on them. So we are doing a, a great amount of work in the employee experience space where we are trying to figure out how to enable decisions and democratize, democratize the data so that it reaches the edge. Right? So you create um, services that enable people to make decisions without having to look at large amounts of data. And this is where Nathan and I are working on what are the decision points inside an organization that would really lend themselves to simplification and curation and elimination, if you will, <laughs> of, of, of those decision points. And this could actually drive overall organizational effectiveness and create the right model for do making organizational transformation. So digital actually is not just about creating new services. It fundamentally changes how organizations do work. And, and that's, I think, the, the power of design within that, that space, which is becoming eminent. So one of our trends is that this is what's happening, D to V. This, what's happening is employee experiences and decisions employees make within a corporation also follow some of these frameworks. Right? So um, can I jump to the next slide? So, so just to put this in perspective, you know, this was internet where there was a, everybody had access to enormous amounts of information and we, we, we tolerated complexity because of this sheer joy of having that information. And then the information traveled with us wherever we went, right? With mobility, we could take it with us, we could look at Google wherever we are. But now, it's too much, <laughs> right? Too much information all the time. So now we are saying, oh, we need higher order services or what we call living services. So what we're talking about, it goes beyond personalization. Living services are services that actually constantly learn more about our needs, intense preferences, and change in real time. Right? They're beginning to keep up with us. How many of you have an iPhone? And you notice that now uh, it tells you how long it takes you to get home without you asking. It's a little freaky, <laughs> but it's beginning to do that. You know, the things are listening and learning, and soon will enable you. And you'll say, it's cool. Right? It's cool. It tells me before I ask. Right? So these are what we're calling living services. Right? They begin to have a human-like quality in terms of being assistive without being interrupted. Right? They're very proximate to us in the environment because they travel with us wherever, and they will have profound effects on our life. We don't realize that the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. So um, this is how we are, we are trying to, with the Amazon Echo or Amazon Tap, all these kinds of things will become sort of table stakes as millennials enter um, in this next generation. They're not averse to using these, these tools. These are natural uh, to them. And you, know, you begin to see the Tesla, which is you know, where Tesla is learning enormous amounts of information about the driving behaviors. Telematics is in there. 
um, we've created um, a, a thing for uh, Pick Plan is a, you know, most of you may have played with um, Nike Fuel Band or any of these kind of devices that you put on your wrist and it told you it ha you had to walk 3,000 steps and after a while you got bored because the data was not interesting in itself and you threw it away and put it in a drawer. But now what's happening is we're beginning to create services that actually tell you, set a goal, right? Let's say I had a baby, wanted to lose weight after the baby. It says lose that baby bump is a personal, personalized um, sort of uh, coach that attaches to the data and then gives me a plan and uh, figures out what to do. So we have these services that are now beginning to help us with the goals we have, not just show us the data of how many steps you walked, but what did that mean for the goal that, that, that I have. So we're beginning to create services like that. Of course, Nest and Birchbox is where it's a platform for you to experience different brands, right? So instead of you figuring out what is the latest set of brands, surprise me, send me a set of things, I'll tell you what I like and I send back the rest similar to Stitch Fix or any of these others where you get, you know, trunk club, send you a, f a few things, you like it, send back the rest. And that's kind of an experience where you don't have to choose. It chooses for you and then you can train it uh, into what you, you like or not. So what we are saying about living services is um, there's a two angles to it. What you know and what you can flex, right? Earlier on experience in the internet age was everybody had the same sort of experience. Now you know with Google, what you're seeing and what I'm seeing is very different based on our pattern. So we're getting to have tailored moments, moments that are very tailored to a particular experience. But as you move up to the uh, upper right, what, how much you know, the ambient as well as other information that you have that you can model, plus the flexibility with which you can deliver that service is what is a living service, right? So that's sort of the nirvana of what we think, whether in the, in the enterprise world or in the consumer world, that people are looking for, those natural services uh, that can happen. And to do that, um, of course, you need data. But we believe that it's not just enough for data scientists to understand that we need designers and data scientists working together. And this is the, the practice uh, Nate and I and a few others at Accenture are beginning to um, bring the left brain and the right brain together of understanding human experience in a way that allows you to create, figure out what the key decision points are. Right? Whether it's in a consumer experience or an enterprise experience, what are the key moments that matter? And at that key moment, what is the data you need to drive that decision? Both from a systematic, rational way, as well as capturing sort of the systematic biases that come into that decision making. Because this is the problem with any of these automated bots, is that I don't have to accept what they're <laughs> saying. I have other factors that will tell me whether I should use that or not. So unfortunately, humans are not um, predictable animals. <laughs> so, um, so what we are, well, what you're trying to do is ask, have designers look at what do you wish you know about the context of the customer. If you knew everything, what new services would you design or change or experiences? And the data led would be what do we already know? What needs to change? What, uh, what can we anticipate? What are the predictive models you can bring? Or what don't I know that I need to know more about? So we are trying to pull these two types of things together. And I predict uh, uh, in this world that um, new data science teams uh, are going to be formed not just by heavy mathematic, mathematically oriented people, but people also who have an understanding of the experiential um, human aspects of work and life and how those teams come together. So we are trying to figure out a new type of dynamic in how we assemble these things in the future. So it seems like you know automated decision making is wonderful, but you know we're all going to want to make decisions uh, about a lot of things. But the decision making process is so time consuming, right? For you have to spend about ninety percent of the time uncovering the relevant trade offs, and then ten percent of the time is spent kind of uh, weighing those trade offs. And it seems like the first part is something that could be. Um, the, the trade-offs that are relevant to you are not the trade-offs that are relevant to someone else. So if, if I go into a, um, uh, a stereo store and I say, oh, I'm looking at these two different components, you know, what's the difference? Typically you'll have a guy who will kind of squint at the sign on the shelf and he'll rattle off the bullet points that you've already read and then he'll look at the other one and rattle off the bullet points that you've already read. And the whole process is waste of time because you have to ultimately then figure out what the trade-offs are. So when I think of the automation process, you know, it, 
doesn't have to be a fully automated decision. It can be you can automate the, 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 the tedious part uh, and the part that doesn't require um, ultimate decision making authority, but can facilitate better decision making, more efficient decision making, and, and uh, um, uh, more enjoyable decision making. Right. It, it can curate or, or, or um, you know, curate the set of choices. And the technologies like augmented reality and that are coming up that can enable you to, to see that uh, picture while you're in that physical space, right? So you're beginning to see the arrival of glasses or your, or your phone that, you know, you, you, most of you go into a consumer electronics who so already have done your homework, right? And you know where to go and what to pick up. Uh, so we're beginning to see that as uh, augmented reality, virtual reality types of techniques go in, you may be able to put on your glasses or you have some other method through which these, um, these curated choices or information, you don't even need the person there, right? So it becomes a more enjoyable, more natural uh, type of experience. So doing that, um, we are you know, working on how to get our designers to become more data literate, um, how to work with data, how to ask the right questions. So new ways of segmentation which considers what we call mindsets or biases. So we're trying to discover in our patterns, you know, it's not just about segmentation work that you might do based on demographics or a geography or things like that, right? You really, more importantly, there are a set of fundamental uh, decision-making um, patterns that are consistent through different types of vertical industries that we believe are driving a lot of the decision-making. So we are beginning to use mindsets, discovering mindsets to figure out how to augment our current segmentation philosophies using these types of human-related things, and also doing a lot of hypothesis testing and experimentation to discover the context, and then figuring out what to flex and how to respond to that data. So the connection between what you know and what you flex is, is, is sort of a, a new way of thinking about how to design sort of data-enabled services. So, and in this process, we don't want to just talk about limited moments, right? This is an insurance example. And most people have said the moments of truth are this quote, premium and claim. And as I was listening to Tatiana, you, you're talking about satisfaction or loyalty or uh, whether you talk about whether they bought more. It's important not just to talk about that, but in, in, in between these transactions, you could make these very efficient, but you may have um, additional moments that are very key in, in actually continuing through the process. So you may have customized solutions, uh, self-service, that human interaction that you have with the stylist may be the thing that keeps you with that service. The affinity or the relationship metrics are really important as you go through this. So we are doing a lot of work in what we call blueprinting, looking at the experience end to end before we talk about where does the insurance thing fit in. And then sometimes you look at the adjacencies, and the adjacencies are important to get right and bring into your data model in order to make that work. Make sense? Okay, so now I pass. This is the difference in consulting. I was working in a team. <laughs> so. uh, so my name is Nathan Shetterly with Tech Labs like Carl. Um, I'm in our artificial intelligence group. It's kind of built out of originally data and platforms and then um, what we called uh, data insights and now artificial intelligence. Uh, I like the way that we've split it up. We have artificial intelligence on one side, which is um, kind of all, everything automated. So how do we, I don't need a human in the loop. And the other side of that we're kind of calling the augmented side of the world, and that's where I sit. Uh, how do we help make better decisions? Um, and as Nan was talking about and alluding to these moments that matter, uh, one of the questions that we're looking at is, so how do we as a consultancy create a framework or create a, a methodology to help our clients address these moments that matter? And that's why I have the picture of Nudge up here. I actually read this uh, uh, on a project uh, a number of years ago now. Um, have uh, maybe a raise of hands. Any of you read Nudge? Anyone heard of... Um, Richard Thaler? Okay, a couple. Behavioral economics in general? Okay. So I believe, it's my hypothesis, that uh, behavioral economics gives us some of the tools and uh, tricks of how we can approach these moments that matter. So um, the beginning of Nudge starts out with, and well, you, guys, you guys should go all read it. It's, it's a quick read and it's phenomenal. Um, starts with an example that says, um, it, it's a study, and what they did is they looked at a number of um, all of the, 
middle schools uh, across the U.S. You're probably familiar with this, and said, uh, you know, what happens? How are people? You know, what are people buying? What are they uh, choosing for lunch? What are the kids choosing? And what most kids are choosing is pizza and fries. Makes sense. Now, what you, what they looked at and what they changed is they said most people are buying kids a, a pizza and fries, but pizza and fries is also the first thing that you show up to when you get in line at the lunchroom. I don't know if you guys remember that, but you know the lunch lady was there with pizza and fries ready to go. So they ran a quick experiment, a little bit of an A/B test. They swapped that out for salad or bananas, and so something healthy. And uh, you have to read the book to get the exact number, but it was something like a 30% increase of kids who decided to go with a healthy, healthy option because it was the first thing they saw. And this whole premise is what they talk about is the power of defaults. Um, and this is one of those tricks that's really, really fascinating to me is you can, we can change uh, you know, the health of our kids by a very simple deciding where uh, we're putting pizza and where we're putting healthy food. And one of the more philosophical points of the book is now that we know that, do we have an obligation to make better choices, to engineer better decision points? Um, in the book, they call it choice architecture, to engineer better choice architecture for folks. And uh, another quick example, if you know the pizza and food isn't kind of your thing, if you look at this from a financial example, um, the U.S. government and uh, the U.K. government have both started up nudge units internally to use these ideas of behavioral economics to affect change without enacting law or dumping a lot of money into problems. So one of the things that they did I find is fascinating in the UK, they did a, a quick A-B test and uh, it was, they sent out two letters, a normal letter saying it's time to pay your taxes and um, a letter that said exactly the same as the other letter except the first line says most people pay their taxes on time in bold. I think they got a 15% lift in people paying their taxes on time. Now, if you think of the, you know, all of the tax revenue that's coming into the UK, and then you think about how much mon the time value versus money of someone paying like six months later, that's an enormous amount of money for essentially free. Like you typed one more letter, like you can't even really calculate the cost of like that. It's such a simple change. Yet when we look generally at these decision moments or at these moments that matter, um, and a lot of companies when they're traditionally doing these designs don't really think about these, um, these uh, default uh, settings um, and some of the biases that go into that. So if you get deeper into behavioral economics, you start to look at, you know, and you can Google, um, you know, biases, uh, and Wikipedia has a list. Um, I'll jump back to this slide later, but essentially what you see is we've started to catalog all of these lists. My favorite here is the IKEA effect. If you uh, build something yourself uh, under, um, studies that they've done, you're most likely going to attribute more value to it. So you're gonna, if you're trying to sell it, um, you build your own table, that table is worth more than the exact replica of that table because you have an emotional connection to it. Um, so we've started to categorize these here on the right. And what we hope to do is to build a process where we can identify these moments that matter in processes and then dive down and understand what are all of the pieces of that moment that matters that we can use some of our technology tools that we have some of the algorithmic uh, advantages we have, some of those design interfaces like data visualization, but also understand kind of this human bias and these, these human tendencies we have of th this behavioral economics, which we call decision science, to um, affect that. So here's kind of a quick example in my very uh, Accenture um, consultant -y slide. You can tell the difference between Accenture and Fjord. Uh, is you have the human biases. You know, these are things like cognitive biases, emotion, the perception you have of value, what your role is, um, you know, what your personal goals are. Uh, it, it's interesting, you know, in the business world, a lot of times if you're selling or working with clients, you get to know that person intimately. Like, what are their hopes and dreams? And, you know, do they want to make this project done and make sure it's successful so they can go on vacation? Or are they looking to get promoted? And you really know that person when you're selling consulting work. Um, that's not the case in most product uh, relationships, but it's starting to be. It's starting to get to the point where, um, you know, as uh, Tatiana's example earlier, you start to get to know, um, we're starting to understand the style and the vibe of these people, and then we're, we're offering that in a almost automated way. There's some humans in the loop, but we're starting to deeply understand the people we're selling to, even in consumer transactions, which before used to be, you know, you go in and buy something off a rack. Um, in addition to those human biases, there's also situational attributes which um, uh, come into effect. And this is, can be a culture of your 
um, area, if there's data available, what technology you have. Um, and then there's the outcomes that are expected, and this is kind of you know some of the traditional things. When we look at managing these decisions now, most of that is spent here. All of these things, yeah, that's the project management. I'm sure you guys have seen a bunch of this. These, these things we generally see as constants, but if you were paying attention at the end of Carl's demonstration, what you saw is we can now start to spin up individual technology stacks for specific problems. So these situational attributes, especially technology that's available in process, can start to be customized. So we have the technology stack at the click of a button to, to uh, um, affect the moment that matters that we need. And so that, those rules are changing. And if you look at that human bias piece, bias piece, well, that's something where it's kind of, at the moment, you're, all of us are statistics um, in you know, our race, uh, how much money we make, our gender, and then you get put into that category. You know, and that's kind of it. It doesn't get more granular. And as we get more and more down to the segmentation of one or these individual things, we can start to understand those biases and whether I'm an employee that's trying to make the best decision possible and able me, augment me to make that decision, or if I'm a consumer, you know, helping me to make something that's going to make me most happy. Uh, Nan didn't talk about it, but she's actually led some work called the Love Index, which kind of values how much you love a brand. And as we look at these way of approaching this problem, we can start to really affect that and measure it. And so then we can use these things to actually affect that moment that matters. And um, you know, it's a consulting slide, so it has to have the word value on it somewhere. So this is going to create some value, whether that's operational efficiency internally or lift in product sales or reduce in churn. Um, and our hope is that we can string together enough of these moments that matter that we can redefine these living services and that each of those moments are going to be customized to ourselves, but not only customized in the offer, but customized in the way that they're delivered. Um, so I'll pause there, uh, just see if there's any questions in that, and then I have a quick use case example that I can take you through that's in the utility industry. It's probably the most boring thing we've seen so far. It's definitely not fashion, and it's probably not as scary exciting as security, but I think it, it highlights some of the points. All right. Um, so, uh, how many of you guys know or anything about the electric industry? Okay. All right, we got some people. Normally, you're like, the power's on, that's all I care about, right? It, it's interesting, I've, I've uh, spent the first half of my career in the utilities industry, and a, there's a lot of people worrying about the customer relationship with the utility industry and how they manage their brand, and it's, and the, you know, I, I continue to repeat, I have the best relationship with PG&E. I automatically bill them so they get my money every month. And I don't hear from them. The power sh all, uh, so far, I've been here four years, the power's always on. Best possible relationship. Um, now, there's a lot going on there. And one of the things that the, the, they're into that bargain is keeping electricity on. And so to do that, a utility company has to uh, do a lot of different things, change out meters, change out transformers. They have a whole field force that's out in the world. And the way that that works, there are people that schedule those field force to go out and do a bunch of work. And there's really, really expensive systems uh, that uh, manage that and they optimize the number of transformers you buy, the number of copper you buy, the number of specific trucks to get into hard to reach places that you have. And it organizes all of this out and then it says, okay, here's how you plan that work. And it gives that to the schedulers to send those guys out, generally guys, but guys and gals to go out and do that work. So what does that mean? Well, uh, for the individual workers, it's interesting because what happens is uh, in that scheduling phase and when you actually decide to go schedule where everyone goes, you have you know, your 20 people, they have to go out and do a bunch of different tasks in a day. What you end up finding is that uh, that system that's there that's supposed to automate everything um, doesn't have anything to do with the way that work actually gets done. Um, and with time, I'll skip here a little bit, but um, these folks that are making this decision are people like anyone else with all those biases that we talked about earlier. And what happens is, uh, you know, you have a perfect schedule that's been laid out by our expensive system, and then uh, it's time to actually go and schedule that. Well, one of our people that called in that had a specific skill we needed isn't there. Okay, so that means now what do I do? I'm, I, was, I was supposed to do all these work, and now I have no one that would have the appropriate skill to go do that. Maybe it's a complicated uh, install that's dangerous, and you have to have a certain um, union level to be able to do that. Also, you know, in this case, we're dealing with a, a utility in the north. Uh, the weather is different. And so now all of our estima estimation about how long things happen or how long it takes to get from one place to another um, are out. And uh, there's some places that are inaccessible. They're in a, just completely inaccessible because of the weather. 
So what happens now is these guys, uh, the schedulers, essentially go back and make their own decisions. So they're going to go make all these own decisions. And how they're going to do that, the, the system is kind of broken down now. We have a break in our thing. So these guys are going to make decisions based on their experience. And these, if um, I'll show you in a moment, but these are kind of mapped out to some of these um, cognitive biases. But if you, you look at across these, you'll see things like um, the IKEA effect, if we go back to that. This is a, uh, an example. When you look at this, what people end up doing is they've built their own Excel sheet with their own model, or they have their own kind of old paper and pen kind of way, and they go back to do that. And so they're like, no, no, I built this way. This is the way that you do this. So this is an interesting uh, phenomenon because uh, we're, we're ignoring all of the digital technology that's there because it's not working for us. We're going back to what we know. And in some cases, if what we know works, great. But if what we know has a bunch of biases in it, for example, one of the common um, uh, uh, urban legends here um, is that, and this is like, a, I think it's a cascading effect where um, it's always known that this type of a job to go do something takes three people. And like everyone just knows that, but it's not true. But so the, well, we're going to create inefficiencies in our system of how we go and deliver this work because um, essentially the digital system broke down and now we're going on gut feeling. So in this example, what, you know, what we're able to do is to go in and essentially create a very thin, almost microservice layer where instead of looking at you know, a huge technology piece and redoing SAP or something like that, we're going to go in and solve this very, very specific problem. And this might be with processes, this might be with technology, and this specific one here, it's really about just optimizing for what you have in that day and creating some more simple tools that are also tracking the efficiency. And the thing that um, we kind of uh, take for granted here in the Valley, and, and Tatiana mentioned this, is that almost everything we do is instrumented. If you go to Google or you work there, you know, you're know um, you under, they, they can do phenomenal research because everything you're doing is kind of um, you know under a camera or under uh, some type of digital tracking system. When we go into some of the larger brands across the globe, that's not the case. And so all of this, you know, these types of approaches here, no one's tracking the efficiency of that. And that's kind of a mentality that I think we need to export as kind of data scientists or people that are in that data world, um, is to going back and as we start to build these new decision systems so that everything will be instrumented and even if people are making weird decisions that the model doesn't make sense for, we can say, look, that's leading to a good outcome and we can kind of reverse that. Because the models generally can only show you what's happened in the past. They can't understand what's um, unpredicted futures. So this is kind of a, um, uh, one place where we're doing this, and this kind of operational decision support system that we're talking about here um, is one example of where we're taking all of these different um, inputs from the emotional bias side, from the technology situational side, and from those outcomes, uh, and going with a kind of a microservice for this one moment that matters in that specific scenario. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Nate. So last year we had the chief operating officer for, uh, uh, or the top uh, data guy from uh, UPS. He came and talked about, you know, they design these optimization algorithms that can exceed the performance of the driver by like 10 or 15 percent, and that was actually relatively easy. That only cost three billion dollars to do. The the hard part was actually convincing the drivers to rely on this, you know, because they think that they're better. You know, they've been doing this all their lives. And so they actually had to do a couple things, interesting things to get buy-in. Like one, they would have these competitions and contests where the drivers would challenge the, the, the algorithms and, and you know, they made it kind of fun and, and then um, gave awards to the drivers that could somehow you know, get closest to the algorithm. But then the other thing is they also had to give the drivers the ability to, to not only override the system, uh, but also to input data that the model hadn't taken account of. So whether or not you know you have to drive around the back, or hey, this guy only likes his delivery at 10 a.m. or or whatever. And so by giving them sort of some control, or in part like an illusion of control uh, over the um, operation of the system, it, it helped them to um, get buy-in. It, it's interesting in um, Nudge. One of the things they talk about more as a bit of um, almost policy is they talk about libertarian paternalism, yep. saying you, you, set the, uh, you set all of the defaults so that if you do nothing, it's the most good for the most people, but people can always opt out. And now they're talking, that was kind of a nudge towards lawmakers, but I think that in your example for UPS, 
it's a good mantra to follow for designing interfaces in general is create that you know default that's the most good but always let people um, over uh, overturn the decision and then track it to understand why exactly. so you can make that system better yeah okay so uh, so that's one of the most I think important issues that we're going to face going forward uh, as we start introducing data science and optimization and automation into the into the workplace the enterprise world is you know getting the buy-in of the people so anyway thanks it's been a wonderful uh,